welcome everybody to the first Carnegie Conversation of the 2010-2011 academic year. I'm Leslie McBride. I direct the Teaching and Learning Programs in the Center for Academic Excellence. The Carnegie Conversations are about teaching and learning. And whether it's a teaching and learning issue in the classroom, about classroom pedagogy, or whether it's a teaching and learning issue that's a national trend, what the Center for Academic Excellence tries to do is identify someone at the heart of that conversation nationally who that we can then invite in to set up and hold a conversation around that topic. And I'm really excited today because I know you're all very well aware that one of the biggest trends in higher education today is online and blended learning. And we all know as professors, as, as people devoted to, to teaching and learning concerns, that blended learning and online learning are uh, making a deep and uh, long-lasting change in higher education on all its various levels related to how it's offered. And I'm really excited about our speaker this afternoon because he is at the heart of that national conversation and he's doing research on student satisfaction and student learning in blended and online contexts. I couldn't be more tickled that Chuck Zuivon is here today. Did I get that last name right? Pretty close. Pretty close. Pretty close. We were talking about pronunciation of his last name, which has a very difficult spelling and uh, 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 needs a little bit of coaching through it. But last names aside, and my uh, inability to pronounce Chuck's, uh, he's got a wonderful grasp of the, the research related to online and blended learning, and it's just fascinating. So before we begin, and before I ask Roy Cook to introduce Chuck and, and tell you a little bit about uh, why we've invited him here today, let me say a couple of things about logistics and, uh, and then make a couple of appreciations. Um, is Patrice Hudson in the room at the moment? You here, Patrice? She, she's uh, still <coughs> attending to details. Well, first and foremost, I want to uh, appreciate verbally, thanks, Patrice, <laughs> the work that Patrice Hudson has done. <laughs> Patrice made all, don't go, because we have a very important question to ask you. She's done all of the arrangements related to this event and related to the workshops that preceded it. Everything related to the wonderful marketing materials that went out, everything related to, to Chuck's arrangements, um, all of the, the physical arrangements, it's been up to Patrice. Thank you so much. You are an all-world program administrator, Patrice, and we really appreciate it. We really do. Um, secondly, I wanted, where's Janelle? I wanted to recognize Janelle Vogley, the Assistant Director for Teaching and Learning, who's also been instrumental in putting together this year's focus on faculty, to introduce to you the uh, instructional designers in CAE, Michael Chamberlain, who's standing against the wall there. Where's Vince Schreck? Is Vince? Right here. There's Vince and Ifong. I found Long Gordon right here, the three instructional designers within the center, and then my co-director of the Center for Academic Excellence, Kevin Keskis, in the back of the room. Uh, and Patrice, where'd you go? She's gone. She She's gone? gone. <laughs> oh, no! She's supposed to tell us where the uh, wine and cheese is located. She went to get the wine. Oh, there's that too. Well, anyway, the wine at a certain point will arrive, and uh, I expect, with you know, keeping my fingers crossed but not holding my breath, that somewhere around 4.30 in the afternoon, we will hear the sound of corks being pulled out of those bottles. That's a signal that the formal part of the program has ended, and we can adjourn to more informal conversations around the topic and with Chuck over a beverage and uh, something to eat. So with that, I'll turn the program over to Roy. And uh, thanks, everybody, today for coming. Well, thanks, thanks Leslie. Let, actually, uh, welcome, everyone. This uh, is a sort of concluding activity of the day of Focus on Faculty, which has become an annual event here at, at Portland State. Uh, and it seems like every year, uh, the, uh, topics they choose, not coincidentally, are very timely with regard to discussions we're having on campus or issues we're having on campus. And this year is no different. 
the discussion that you just finished about large classroom instruction, the discussion about online and blended learning, have all been uh, topics of uh, what I might describe as spirited conversation over the last uh, 12 months or so here at the university. Um, before we go further, though, I would like to acknowledge the, the folks in the Center for Academic Excellence for all the work they do uh, in supporting your teaching and learning activities uh, throughout the year and uh, how they sort of choose these uh, topics uh, in ways that really do support uh, the kinds of directions that the institution, oh, there's Mike Lane, I haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> the kinds of directions the institution is, uh, is headed. Yeah. Um, so, um, reflecting on last year's discussion, uh, or sets of discussions throughout the campus, uh, principally um, generated by an interest in expanding online education here uh, at the university. Um, I was actually heartened, sort of, uh, sometimes maybe I should say, by the fact that there was so much interest in the student learning aspects of online education. And, um, you know, this is something that clearly people have been, at, in academia, have been interested in for a very long time. Um, as technology has evolved from, you know, should we use PowerPoints in class to fully online uh, education. But it, it does uh, exemplify the general interest that we have here on the campus uh, for making sure that our students really are uh, learning and, and that we're providing them that opportunity in class. So. Um, the discussions were much more broad than student learning, but uh, that one at least I think is a very, very useful one, and I hope it, it continues. Um, I'm pleased that today to welcome Chuck Jubin from, uh, from the University of Central Florida. Um, I had the uh, opportunity and the pleasure to have breakfast with uh, Chuck today. And although I was embarrassed as I had a great big pile of eggs and stuff on my plate and he was eating oatmeal. Um, without the brown sugar. Without the brown sugar, yeah. Okay, so rub it in. <laughs> um, we had a wonderful conversation sort of spanning uh, almost all of the issues that I hope he will talk about uh, today. Uh, everything from why do you do this kind of uh, online education uh, to how effective uh, is it to what sort of systems and structures and organizations are necessary to make it worthwhile. Um, and so uh, we're all heartened to know that we don't have to completely invent this stuff from the beginning, that there are successful models, not only successful models, but successful models at institutions that are very, very much like ours. It's like we were talking from the same uh, glossary of terms this morning right. when we talked about the, the nature of our students, why they are interested in uh, online education as an as a, as a issue of flexibility and convenience in their busy schedules, uh, the fact that our students uh, range from full-time traditional students to part-time students, that we have a bunch of students who commute to campus once a week. All of these kinds of issues are, are common. So what uh, Chuck brings to us today, I think, is very, very relevant to our particular situation and his years of experience are, uh, are very important. He is the director of the research initiative for teaching effectiveness at the University of uh, Central Florida. And um, he has been a faculty member there since 1970, actually. And his uh, scholarly area is in research design and statistics, which is pretty handy for some of the work that uh, we do, I'm assuming. And uh, I bet you have something to say about the way we uh, assess our teaching from, from time to time. Uh, He's, um, I have, you know, a couple of pages of stuff I could say about him, but let me, let me talk sort of in, in more general terms. He's got a long list of publications in very reputable journals, uh, both from the um, more direct uh, uh, disciplinary kinds of approaches, but also on uh, teaching and learning. He's had grants from the uh, Centers for, for Disease Control, the National Science Foundation, the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation, etc. And uh, in 2000, uh, he was named the University of Central Florida's first ever Pegasus professor for his extraordinary research, teaching, and service to the institution. And in 2005, he became an emeritus uh, professor at the institution. Uh, as you can imagine, with that long history in um, technology-assisted uh, education, he's in high demand around the country for the uh, work that he's done. 
and he's visited uh, institutions in the United States and around the world uh, to try to share some of the work that's been done at the University of Central Florida and help us all move forward. So uh, with that, I think I'll introduce uh, Chuck Julian. Oh, God, you know, this, I, I hate it when this happens. Um, so one of the things I always do is, you know, you've got the CV in front of you. I'm not going to stand up here and read it. So I asked Chuck, well, what can I tell him about you that's not in the CV? And he said, well, tell him that there's an old geezer who's going to run the Disney Marathon. Yes. I'm assuming he meant himself. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't go any further for that, but I'm impressed. I was, yeah. I was Good afternoon, everybody. Are, are we okay with sound? Yeah. Good. I am really honored to be here. I really am. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I heard it rains. <laughs> uh, uh, technology is unbundling everything. It is unbundling everything. It has unbundled music. It has unbundled books. Okay. It has unbundled publishing. Okay. Here's an example of a children's book that was published by the Amazon publishing arm, self-published. It's a beautiful book. It's published. It may be in the long tail. You never know. Okay. Real estate is unbundled. Uh, books, if you look at an issue of Fast Company saying that Steve Bezos is trying to do to the book what Steve Jobs did to music, trying to unbundle it completely. There's a latest Newsweek talking about the unbundling of creativity in America, that technology is ruining creativity in our students. It's talking about that. One of the things I hope gets unbundled in academia is publishing. Have you ever had this experience? You want to write a manuscript? You want to publish it. So you write the manuscript. Two and a half years, or nine months later, you get it back with extension revisions required. You look at it and say, after a while you do it, you submit your manuscript. It may or may not be accepted. Two and a half years later, it's published. Your cutting edge ideas are no longer cutting edge because everybody's blogged about it. Everybody's talked about it. Sooner or later, that's got, to, that's got to change. So at the University of Central Florida, my job is to do two things. One is to evaluate the impact of online learning. I'm going to call it blending, but you call it hybrid. And any other technology, its impact on students, on faculty, on the institution. That's my job. Uh, we've been doing it for the last 15 years. And it reminds me of my favorite Russian parable. When you dance with a bear, you can't quit when you're tired. <laughs> it has changed. It has morphed. What we thought was technology 15 years ago, we wouldn't even recognize. And two things have happened on our campus. Well, one thing especially. Landscape amnesia. You know what that is? There's a wonderful book by Jared Diamond called Germs, Guns, and Steel. And he talks about landscape amnesia. We've only been doing it for a little over a decade, but no one can remember UCF without our technology initiatives. We've always had it, if you know what I mean. No one remembers what the institution was like before it. It's the same with our faculty center. It's only 10 years old. But nobody can remember when we didn't have a faculty center. And that happens. That happens. Now, I'm a big fan of Jay Forrester at MIT and complex systems and systems dynamics. Three adages. One is once you introduce an intervention into a complex system, you can never tell how it's going to ripple through. Okay? Secondly, the results will be counterintuitive. Okay? Counterintuitive. Programming, you write the code, something else happens. Okay? And lastly, there will be side effects, both positive and negative. Have you ever raised children? <laughs> it will be happy. Most of the time, we're dealing with the side effects because we didn't anticipate what would happen. Let me give you one example. I'm going to leave you for a minute. I forgot my water. Don't go away. I heard some people came in at the back and said, I'm going to sit in the back in case I have to leave early. Right. Blended hybrid learning. Model for a course. Leverage one course on a Monday, rest of it online. Leverage the second course on a Wednesday, rest of it online. You know where I'm going with this. That's one model, one of many models. Okay. 
So we have an ERP system. We call it people hard. Okay? What did it do? It didn't recognize blended learning courses, so it put three different classes in the same examination period at the same time. Okay? It's the unanticipated side of that. Who would have thunk that it would have but it did it. We had anticipated doing that. Now, <laughs> my provost who just retired, Terry Hickey, told me that when he thinks about blended learning, hybrid learning, I'll, use, I'll try to use Portland speak, okay? Online learning. The generation of children that are coming into our, our young adults coming into our campuses, the budget problems, and all these things that are happening, that it doesn't, didn't ever bother him a bit. He slept like a baby. Slept for an hour, woke up and cried for an hour, <laughs> <laughs> throughout and through the night. <laughs> all right, now, this is the University of Central Florida. Okay, this is it. In 1970, I drove up to Florida Technological University and I read Volkswagen from the University of Wisconsin with my wife in a two-lane road with palmettos and um, armadillos at the side of the road to a five-building university in East Central Florida in a sand pit. And she turned to me and said, what the hell have you done? Where are you taking me? And I said, no, 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 baby, don't worry. It's got all kinds of potential. It's really a great place. And in two years, I'll be at Stanford, so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, so, Stanford blew it. Okay, it's 40 years later. It's 40 years later. This is my 41st year at the University of Central Florida. We are now at 56,000 headcount. We are the third largest university in the country. And the good news is we're growing. The bad news is we're growing, okay, and it continues to grow. So now my place, in a way like your place, is built like you. We serve your community, we're trying to build internationally outstanding programs, but we've got to accommodate our community. The way to do it, at least the way we've been able to do it, is at least with hybrid learning, blended learning, and online learning. Let me show you, are we doing okay? Are we doing all right? Give me some feedback here, I hate to die, I hate to die up here some models for blended learning. The traditional model, and I'll do this quickly, looks something like this, okay? On one side of it, it's fully online, and I know it might be contentious here. By the way, these slides are all available to you. On our website, there are hundreds of slides. You can have anything I have. You can have it all. Please, take it all, okay? And, uh, and then there's fully face-to-face. -face. Somewhere in the middle, the combination of those yields blended learning. And what's been going on for a long time is, how much of that is blended learning? Is it 60-40, 70-30? Don't go there. Don't go there, don't do it. It's a, it's, a, it's a black hole, you'll never do it. You can blend in any number of ways. The way the picture looks institutionally is something like this. Now, um, the fully online is usually an institutional initiative. And the questions that surround it, I'll try to deal with it. The big question with fully online is quality. I will try to deal with the quality issue today in terms of what, what we do with it and how we deal with that notion of quality. Okay, okay. And there are lots of takes in quality. I'll talk to you about it. I mean, they come from all over. They come from student voices, the quality. We all have reputations of instructors. There's a great, there's a great thing that's associated with St. Augustine. I love it. I thought I understood it until I tried to teach it. Has any of that come to haunt you? <laughs> yeah. I probably know one out here, but it certainly has me. I've been up there moving my mouth, and I knew deep in my heart I had no business moving my jaws because I knew what I was talking about, but I didn't know how to teach it. On the other side are technology-enhanced courses. I would expect they're fully face-to-face, -face, but some technology is going on. I would expect there's a lot more of that happening at Portland State than you really know about. We, know, we also say to our students, you can expect to have a technology component in every course. Even if our instructors say, I don't use technology, that's okay because who does? They do. They do. They use it. Do you remember what episode 42 of Star Trek was? It's called The Trouble with Tribbles. That's what these courses are, they're tribbles. They're growing, they're out of control, they're using them in every way, and I'll try to explain to you how they're using. In the middle is blended. And blended can take on three forms. Ah, I said blended. Hybrid. Yes. Hybrid. 
hybrid blended, whatever, you know. Okay. You, you know what I'm saying. All right. One, there's enabling blends. That is, it gives the kids access. It gives them access to courses. Then there's enhancing blends. You can augment the things you do with technology. You really can. I told Roy this morning, I taught statistics for 25 years, wrestled with teaching how, how to teach kids sampling distributions, and I did it every way I could think of. Stood in my hand, I, I did everything, and I always come back crushed. You know, a kid once said to me, you teach a parking lot course. And I said, what does that mean? He said, it makes sense in here, but as soon as I hit the parking lot, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. So, and then one of my graduate students said, Chuck, I found this applet. I said, what's an applet? And it was a little applet that showed the central limit theorem being developed. And the kids looked at it and said, oh, is that all there is to it? He said, yeah, maybe this technology has something. That's an enhancing blend. And I'll show you some more of that. And then there are transforming blends, where courses are completely transformed. They can be completely transformed. And the thing is, it's frightening to do it. The first time I taught this blended course, it was a mess. Complete, absolute mess. Disaster. This can be used. Okay? This can be used. Anything can be used. It's interesting. I ran into a girl. You know, we're UCF. You know what the kids call us? I'm a long way away, so John hit my president over here. You can't finish. That's what they call us. Okay. And I was in an in in elevator, and a little girl was on the phone, and she said, no, it's okay, I have one. And I, I, I just couldn't stop. I said, what are you doing? I asked, could you mind coming? They, the other thing they say about UCF is it's a four-year degree. Four years to get your degree and a year to find a place to park. So whoever was in the parking lot had called everyone on their circle of friends to tell them they were leaving the parking place. And if any of their friends were cruising the parking lot, they wouldn't leave until one of them came and took the parking place. Now, would you ever think of doing that? No. No. Not our generation. Not our generation. Now, we have Jay Brophy, who teaches a transformed blended learning course. 500 people in psychology. Two nightmares together. 500 people in a course and blended learning. Ah, oh, how bad can it get? How bad can it get? And he uses this. He uses this as the hook. The first thing he says, you know what we're all doing in class is turn these off. Jay says, leave it on. Let your cell phone ring. And when it rings, he answers it. He goes through there and answers it, and he weaves what's ever on the call into what he's talking about. It's masterful. It extinguishes more cell phones than you can imagine. You can imagine. Then he has cell phone day. He said, if you all bring your cell phone in, get them to ring at the same time, I'll give you 100 free points. And it's like a U2 concert. Waving your cell phone, <laughs> and they're doing it, and it is. What has he done? He's like a Jesuit. He said, I understand that you love this. Instead of telling you to check it at the door, bring it on in. Now, he does everything else the way you would do in a course. Backward engineers, scaffolds the course. Bill's a very rigorous course. But the first day, he gives them a syllabus in psychology. Here's a syllabus. Six questions. Who are you? How did you get that way? Can you change if you want to? Can you change someone else once the bloom is off the rose? What groups do you belong to and why? And why do people do stupid things? That's a syllabus. Not really, but he gets them. What he has said, do not check your technology at the door and come up and then work with, if you'll excuse me, barf board. Blackboard, okay, okay. In terms of doing it, he integrates theirs and his technology, and it works very well. He is sought out, and he teaches ex extremely, extremely. He's very effective. Okay, all right. Clay Shirky wrote a book called "Here Comes Everybody." This is the way it was. We used to broadcast, didn't we? We broadcast it out to the kids, and then they figured out that they could talk to us. Then they started talking to each other. Then they started talking to each other more. And then, in some cases, it got, oops, the red lines. It got nuclear. It vaporizes the boundaries, of course. It vaporizes, of course. This is really freaky. I give you two examples. It can happen. It may not happen. If you teach a blended course and you have a website, 
It's entirely possible that a student has come to me and my, and my teaching, come say, oh, there's this, there's this guy at Portland State who teaches the same course. His website's a lot better than yours. <laughs> Why don't you go look at it? He uses Flash and uses Adobe <laughs> and uses all kinds of good stuff and he's got a lot of really good examples. It would help you there. Why don't you go take a look at it? <laughs> Why not? Why not? It's no longer this sequestered little thing. You know, it's not there. Here's another example, Gardner Campbell, okay? Gardner Campbell at Baylor University uses Twitter, teaches on Twitter. When he was at Mary Washington, he was teaching a theater course and his kid, the, the students were blogging about the play. They were blogging about the play. Well, the playwright, playwrights being what they are, was cruising the net to see if he could find his name and he found the blog. So he joined him. He spent the whole semester blogging with the kids on the play. Only through technology would that happen. Doesn't happen every time. Doesn't happen every time, but it can happen. And it is pretty exciting when it happens. Now my job is to evaluate. Here's what we do. I'll spend a little time on this. And I'll give you data. I have data. First of all, the thing is, do they succeed as well in online and blended courses as they did where? In face-to-face -face courses. I'll say this to you now and you'll probably kill me. Since when did face-to-face -face courses become the gold standard for <laughs> education? How did that happen? How did that happen, you know? Let me say something about faculty members, my faculty members. This is going to be cruel. If they suck face-to-face, -face, they're going to suck every other one else. I don't, you know. My favorite line on regular professor, this guy is so boring, my pillow needs a pillow. <laughs> Okay. We, deal with it, we, we deal with that in terms of success, and I'll give you data on success. But that has seemed to have been the gold standard. Okay. People will say, don't they cheat online? And my response is, duh. Don't they cheat everywhere else? Do you expect technology to make up for a lack of character? You know, but, you know, they say it facilitates it well. And then retention. One of the big rubs on this is retention. Do they stay? Do they stay? Learning preferences. What do we do with that? Do we accommodate student learning preferences in any way, shape, or form? I mean, it's an important issue. It's an important issue. We have pretty much abandoned the whole notion of learning style. Okay, what we have done, for a number of reasons, and I'd be happy to share with you why we abandoned that issue. One is because it's not practical to craft everything in your course to match all of the, all of the learning styles. It really is not a practical kind of thing. And the second thing is, uh, Tony Gracia at Cincinnati says, if you teach to everybody's learning style all the time, don't they get bored? Which is another interesting question. We've adopted a medical school model out of the University of Mississippi Medical School for training physicians of adolescents. Training them, they, they use a model called reactive behavior pattern. I have worked 12 years with William A. Long, the director of adolescent medicine at the University of Mississippi, to develop measurement protocols for reactive behavior patterns. And we use that, not to tailor the instruction, but to validate students, to say that we understand the way you communicate, we understand your methods of communication, and we're going to try to re respond in a way that you will understand this. And, I, I, and you have, that's all available to you. I've made a measurement protocol. If there are psychologists in here, I'm a psychologist that breaks with psychology. It takes fully 30 seconds to administer. You know, kids don't, if you give them a 170 item thing, they're not gonna to respond to it. I'll give you just one quick example of that, how we use this. There's one type that in this system, when we use classification, that's aggressive, high energy type, and independent. So they tend to be very confrontational. They're not mad, they just like to confront, and they're very good at it. In my statistics classes, this was always the kid that said, I don't believe it, derive it. Derive it. So I said, all right, I'll derive it. And walking up to the board said, hope to hell I remember how to derive this. <laughs> because if I didn't, I lost a kid. And I'll tell you right now, I'm working with a kid now who's of this type. Intellect is nothing, as the, you know, they're bright, and all, they're bright people in all of these types. Nothing to do with that. But it's his style. It's a faculty member's son. Chuck, would you tutor him for the SAT? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His name is Alex. And Alex is an aggressive, independent, in your face, whatever he feels, he tells you. He's not mad, he just says what he feels. So he stopped me the other day, and he said, I'm bored, I don't think you're that smart, you don't look like a professor, in fact, you look goofy. That was his words exactly. Now, how do I deal with that? 
that's not too far off from some of the stuff you deal with. Now, you can do a lot of things with a kid like that. You could finesse them. Wrong. You could finesse them and say, Alex, I'm only doing this for your own good. Turns them off like that. Okay, here's what I said to him. Alex, your nose is too small. Therefore, you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain. <laughs> and that's why you're having trouble with the SAT. Now, we had a hell of a fight. <laughs> but he got over it, and we moved on. If I had tried other strategies with this young man, it wouldn't have worked, especially trying to finesse him. You know, I'm doing it for your own good. He doesn't believe that, and he never will believe that. There's nothing wrong with that. Interestingly enough, this type always has leadership ability, and they gravitate to leadership positions. It's interesting. There are negatives and positives about that. But I have a measurement protocol, and we have developed ways to work with each one, one of these students. Okay, ways to work with one of these students. Okay. Um, generations. We have a new generation of students on our campus in these courses, in these blended courses. And it is an issue. It is an issue. If you go out now and look in our society, there is a continual background buzz on generations, the generational narrative. I can give you all kinds. Um, there's a commercial called the Sprint Free and Clear Plan for Sprint. And it's the mature CIO uh, saying, this is my new Sprint Free and Clear Plan. It's my way to stick it to the man. And the, the Gen X assistant is saying to him, but aren't you the man? So, and then you're sticking it to yourself? The guy says, well, maybe. There's another great Toyota commercial. Toyota, Toyota's had a tough time lately. But there's a commercial of the millennial kid in the car, the next generation kid in the Toyota saying, oh, this is cool. It's got nav and Bluetooth. It's going to be so easy. And the baby boomer father says, oh, it's not that easy. It's not as simple as pushing a button. And then the kid said, well, what's this? It's a button. And the old man throws him out of the car. It's a generational narrative. It's there. What the greatest one that's ever happened is a Super Bowl commercial. The kid in Pampers doing E-Trade. It's a generational narrative saying to you, young people are much more facilitated with technology than you'll be. It's saying this. You read The Onion? Okay. Headline. Eccentric student reads entire book. Okay. It's, a gen it's a generational narrative. Um, and, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's important. I think as an instructor, we all have to decide what we're going to do with that in terms of what's happening. I once said at the University of South Carolina that I worried about the critical thinking skills of the digital generation. And I got this note from a student at the University of South Carolina. And if you will, I'm going to read it to you. Dear Chuck, you know this is going badly. <laughs> One of the things you said about net generation students is they have suspect critical thinking skills. An example you used was that they cannot analyze a Russian liter literary figure. Excuse me. Is this really the correct way to measure whether or not if someone of my generation has critical thinking skills? I will agree that most of us cannot analyze complex textual material, but how relevant is that to our daily lives? If our livelihood depended on telling you the major literary motifs of 18th century Spanish literature, we could do it. Okay? We could do it. However, Chuck, our critical thinking skills have been diverted to things that are more relevant to our daily lives and what we will be asked to do in the future. For example, using Excel instead of reciting an esoteric concept. As you said, someone of the mature generation might sit down and read the manual for a new cell phone. My generation will learn by interaction, with the phone itself or through a social network, not by isolating oneself and passively reading the narrative of the manual. On a show like 24, there's an enormous social network one must follow in order to understand what is happening. In video games, one must manage a large number of sub-goals that produce multiple paths to a final outcome. My main question to you then is this, Chuck. Is the current definition or way of measuring critical thinking outdated? Perhaps critical thinking skills should not be measured by the ability to analyze David Copperfield, but by the ability to navigate all the features of your new cell phone. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? It's a voice. 
It's a voice. It's a voice and a voice we have to deal with. Now, as we look at this, we try to look at the interaction of many mature faculty with these students uh, to deal with this. And it, and, it, and it really does become important. I have a whole thing that we can do on this. If you're interested in working in the generations, I would be happy, happy to deal with you and how we relate to them. Uh, the only thing I can do with this now is Neil Howe, who's written a wonderful book in sociology, talks about these generations, and he answers three questions. And, the, and they are these. How many baby boomers does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is it takes 11. 10 to stand in a circle and go ohm, and one to say, I'm the light. <laughs> it's a good line. How many Gen Xers does it take? It takes one. They just say, screw it. <laughs> And how many next generation baby boomers does it take? And the answer is, oh, no, no. Their parents would never let them do anything as dangerous and dirty as changing a light bulb. <laughs> now, that's satire, but in a sense, it's a, when we look at our faculty, we're mostly Gen X and ba baby boomers with a whole population of millennial generation. And I, and I, I and uh, how much, were, were we all right in time? Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you one more story. Stan McKenzie is the retired provost at Rochester Institute of Technology. And he's a Shakespearean scholar. And he has a three-question litmus test to tell whether you're a digital generation person or not. I am not. I frankly hate technology. Okay? I defeat it. You know, I don't, I, you know. Uh, well, anyway. Here's the first question. Who said I regret that I have one life to live for my country? Above average in Portland State. Nathan Hale. Within 10 years, when did he say it? You know, 1777. Yeah. On what day of the week did he die? That's the question. That's the question. We sat around there and said, well, we don't know, but we knew in colonial period they tended not to hang people on Sunday. So we have a one in six chance of guessing. This is the Lepman's test. It's for you, for me. That last question triggers in our minds. I have to research this problem. You know, you don't do it any differently. You go to Google like everyone else. But in your mind is, I have to research this problem. Because we're academics. Because we do what we do. So I said, Stan, I'm going to try this. I went down to my graduate student, Tara, and I said, Tara, I bet you can't. And you know that's the way to motivate a graduate student. I'll bet you can't. Six, you know, 30 seconds she was back, they hung him on a Sunday. They hung him on a Sunday. But the way we think is different. The way we think is different. Then I was doing a thing for uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education, telling the story of Stan McKenzie. And one of his associate provosts was on her crackberry in the audience texting Stan, telling him, Chuck is telling the story. And he texted back to her saying, if you can't tell Chuck I don't use it that anymore because no one knows who Nathan Hill was. <laughs> it's an interesting story in terms of that generation. We're doing lots of research there. And it, I think it's relatively important. Uh, to do this. Okay, now, predictive models, can you predict who will be successful and not? There's a whole thing going on now called analytics, where they're trying to predict who will likely to succeed or not in these courses. It may be important trend. And personal geographies. What you find is these students are tending to build personal geographies of how they learn. They're assembling their own learning environments. And it's interesting we're following that. In the middle of this, satisfaction. Student satisfaction, and I'll show you that. And we're all faculty members here, so I can say this. The ultimate oxymoron. Faculty satisfaction. Mm -hmm. It didn't go well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Demographics. Who are they? Information fluency. What, while we're dealing with this, in case narratives. People who are successful here find out what they do. And do it. We're researching all of this. Now here's what my faculty say to me. And your provost is here. That's good, because he needs to hear this. Okay. They say to me this, Chuck, that's all well and good. That's good for the press, the board of trustees, blah, 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 blah. Has nothing to do with what's going on in my course. And they're absolutely right. They're absolutely right. If you said that to me, you would be right. It doesn't have anything to do with computer science or philosophy or English or literature or mathematics. So here's the deal that we offer our faculty. If you, if you were mine, you want to do some research in any of this area, any of it, tangentially, in your discipline, I will help you do the research. I will help you design the study. I will do it. 
I will get the data collection protocols for you. I will build them for you if they're not available. I will steal them for you if they are available because we, we know how to get around copyright now. Okay? I will get to the institutional database for you. I will get the protocols for you. If you can or won't, I will collect the data for you. My office will do it. We'll go get the data for you. And I'll analyze it for you and I will give it back to you in publication quality format. And it's your intellectual property. You do whatever you want with it. Just do the damn research. Okay? I can't write the manuscript for you, but I have an editor who will help you turn it into English. Okay? I will find a publication for you, a journal, and I will get you published. Okay? I have a broad travel budget, small but a travel budget. I will send you to your professional conference to present your research. And if you go somewhere like Budapest, Lahaina, or Dublin, I will go with you and help you. <laughs> okay. Now, the strategy, we have built the scholarship of teaching and learning having to do with this area within the disciplines, within philosophy, within theater, within English, within speech, and it's authentic, and it's going on. And it's, and it's built this wonderful, wonderful subcultural research that's generated from you, generated from the faculty. It's the best thing we've ever done. We do it on the cheap. My office is two people and two graduate students. You can do amazing things. I mean, and some of the private things we're working on, um, isn't it, in, well, some, some quick assessment. We're working on the whole assessment thing. You know, people will say, multiple choice tests don't work online. Yeah, you're right. They don't. It's forcing the whole assessment paradigm from objective, non-contextual, and non-authentic to reflective, contextual, unauthentic. It's a lot harder to evaluate in this. You know, it's not as easy as giving a multiple choice test and scoring it anymore. Lot, lot, we're working on all kinds of models. One, one of our faculty members is working on something called constructive engagement, that students are actively involved in their own and the evaluation of their peers from day one in the course, and they hate it. They hate it, then they'll accept it, and then they like it. Once they, then they're accustomed to it, they have a voice in this. We're working on that. Um, I don't have on here, but theater. We have a spectacular project in theater. John Schaefer in theater came to me and said, Chuck, I want to produce the play Antigone. I want half the audience to be at Bradley University. I want half the audience to be at UCF. I want half the actors to be at Bradley. Mm -hmm. I want half the actors to be at UCF. And I want to broadcast it over the internet. And he did it. He produced that as a, a theatrical thing. And then he did three. He did it at Waterloo. He produced his rewriting of Alice in Wonderland. He produced it at those two institutions at the University of Otter Waterloo in Ontario. And he's become a rock star. He's dealing with instant, instant fame. Okay? He is celebrated in the technology area and vilified in theater for ruining theater for ruining theater, but he's dealing with instant fame, instant fame, and it happens. Um, we, have a blended, we have a blended algebra initiative going on that we're researching pedagogy, persona. What do you do with your persona when you're teaching, when you're now online? I do webcasts. I hate doing webcasts because I don't know who I am. I don't know what I am. I don't know if I'm having any effect. It's really difficult. And Web 2.0 we'll talk about. Okay. I've, I've got to go quicker. I, oh, that's my cell phone. That. All right. And student success. Let's talk a little bit about that. Let me show you what we do with student success. Here's what happens. When you measure student success in your course and you stay in your course, you have a lot of options. Stop looking at that. You have a lot of, you have a lot of options. Okay? You can do projects, you can do things, you have multiple approaches to student success within the boundaries such as they are of a course. As you go up the institution, it gets harder and harder. You run out of things that will let you measure success. And I'm using that word carefully. This is what we do. The only thing I have at an institution of 56,000 students are grades. And they're a terrible measure. Where are they? You know? So here's what I do. Um, if you look at my departments, the grade distributions are wildly different. You know, one department you know, gets very, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying. It'll be the same here at Portland State. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that that's true. Now, um, <laughs> when I say this business of success, how many of you have read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? 
your generation is showing. Okay, there's a great quote in there. There is such a thing as quality, but every time you try to measure it, something goes haywire. You just can't do it. I love that book. It was rejected 121 times. Okay, and the, and the publisher finally gave Persig $3,000 saying, I'm doing this because it's the right thing. Don't expect another dime from this book. That's exactly what he said to it. Exactly what he said to them. What I do is I take grades and I declassify them. Okay? A, B, or C is success. Anything else is not success. Not failure, it is not success. It's binary. Lose information, gain reliability. Gain reliability. Now, what I do then is I take courses in these modes and as best we can, we match them up. We match them up. And then I look at success, if I defined it, with all its flaws, in W in our pilots, which is fully online, M, which is a blended hybrid course, and face-to-face -face courses. And so I look at these. I look at these and I say, what are the success rates in these modes? And this is what's happening at UCF. And this is what is happening is, and I, you can see it beginning to inch up, the blended is beginning to, is beginning to get to amortize a little more. And people will say to me, is that successful? Well, with the numbers that I work with, with 100,000 students, you know, is that significant? Yes, everything is significant. The question is now, will you live, can you live by gaining those additional 4, 5, 6% success once it begins to happen? That's what happens in this. That's what happens in this. Now, here's something else that we're doing. We're doing more than this, because I'm going to say this, and I'll probably get killed for this too. Mode is not a treatment. The mode of a course, whether it's online, is not really a, a, a statistical treatment. We do a lot of data mining. And what I do for my deans and my chairs is I do things like this. I build decision trees. Now here's one decision tree of many that I built. Because as soon as I show somebody a decision tree, they'll say, I want to see another one. Mm -hmm. So here's one with generations and, um, and blended learning and gender. Somebody wanted to see with a differential effect and gender. So it's a decision tree. Look at the top node. There's, the, there's an overall success rate, 91%. You see it? And then in the, in the leaves below it are success rates for males and females. And my daughter, who teaches feminist literature at the University of Tennessee, says that that node is the only good piece of data that I have. <laughs> Interestingly enough, we're finding, and generally people are finding, that females succeed at a higher rate than do males in these, you know, and then if you look at the generations, what you're going to see is, you're going to see is that the older generations tend to succeed at a higher rate than the younger generations do, for whatever reason, and we're researching that. Interesting. Predictors. What predicts success? Oh, people always say, Chuck, all right, that doesn't even do with quality and learning objectives. Give me a definition of quality. Okay, here it is. Here's Chuck's definition of quality. Clarity, authenticity, utility, suspense, economy, depth, proportion, vividness, brilliance, sensitivity, emphasis, authority, flow, and precision. That's my definition of quality. Okay, that's my definition of quality in terms of what it, where it is. I mean, it's hard. As I said this morning at breakfast, you remember Justice Potter? I can't give you a definition of pornography, but I know it when I see it. I mean, that's, that's great. Predictors. Predictors. We try to figure out what's going to predict success. You'll find this interesting. Three domains we use. Demographics. What do they like? Demographically, sure. You want to do that. Ability, SAT, ACT, that kind of stuff. And their academic performance, which is GPA. Do you want to see what predicts success? Not demographics, not ability, how they perform historically with their GP. That's what predicts. If they're good students, they'll be good students in any mode. You want to see what predicts withdrawal? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing predicts withdrawal. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Now, I see the wine's coming in, so I better hurry up. Mm. It's just 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock? All right. Plenty of time. All right. Student satisfaction. Students take 
These courses for three reasons. Convenience, convenience, and convenience. Those are the three reasons in that order. Okay? I have yet to say, have a student say to me, Chuck, on any of my questionnaires, I am taking this blended hybrid course because I think I will function at the higher level of Bloom's taxonomy. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't gonna happen, folks. Ain't gonna happen. I'm gonna take this because I'm I'm gonna take this because I'm working two jobs and I can't find a parking place. I'm a single parent. This is con more convenient for me. This responds to my lifestyle. That's why they take these courses. They also think they're going to be easier. They're not. Oftentimes faculty think they're not really teaching anymore, so they put a course and a half in a box and broadcast it. Kill the students and kill themselves. And say, oh, this whole mode, it doesn't work and it can't work. Okay, do it. Let me show you the satisfaction curves that we repeatedly get for this, for blended courses. They look like this. They look like this. Generally, they are satisfied. They are satisfied on our campus continuously. Very few are generally dissatisfied. There are some, and it may not be them. There are some faculty for whom this is not your cup of tea. Don't do it. Don't do it. You won't like it. They are not dissatisfied generally. They are ambivalent. Do you know what ambivalence is? You felt ambivalence coming in here. You've been through a day of workshops. Then you've got... I feel ambivalence right now. <laughs> My technology died. No, it's just gone to sleep. Gone to sleep? Uh, well, I can still talk about ambivalence because now I'm feeling ambivalent. <laughs> Take care of it. Thank you very much. Um, you came into this workshop after... after this talk after the, the, the day, and you felt some ambivalent feelings about coming in here, didn't you? You got to get ready for classes. You don't know who this clown is. Try to get ready for this. Well, I just flew 3,000 miles. I'm exhausted from last week. And I'm flying on this plane saying, why the hell did I say yes? You know, it, those ambivalent feelings. Um, that's what we're dealing with with these kind of things. So, students say things like this to me. They say, I like submitting my assignments online, but worry about, worry about my computer skills. I just don't know what to do. It's an ambivalent feeling. The subject matter in this partially online course was fairly complex, and despite passing the class, I don't understand the majority of it. Don't you hate that? You know? I can remember people coming up to me 20 years later saying, I remember you, and I remember your jokes. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart, okay? <laughs> Online learning gives the same attention to every student. Although I learn well by myself, others may not. And others may need face-to-face. -face. I mean, that's what they say. That's, that's what they're feeling. It's what you're feeling. Now, if you're feeling, you know, pure hatred, don't go there. Don't go there. It won't be for you. But if you want to explore it. Now, here's what they say. The positives are the convenience, always first. Reduce logistic demands. Let me translate. I don't have to find a parking place. Okay? Increase learning flexibility. They do indeed. They do indeed. And they like the technology. My friend Lance Lochner, who is a social economist at the University of Western Ontario, said, look, Chuck, they see a reduced opportunity cost. You know opportunity cost in economics? It's a reduced opportunity cost for getting an, for getting an education. There are no negatives at the University of Central Florida. There are only positives. There are only positives. The first thing is they lament is the lack of face-to-face -face time. They love the convenience and they miss the face-to-face. -face. They feel that ambivalence all of the time. Okay? Technology problems? Come on. Two kinds of people ride motorcycles. Those bend down, those are going down. It's going to go down. It's going to go down, and it's going to leave you at the worst possible time. It never will be thus. Everybody who tells you technology tells you it's so great and it's going to do everything, then it doesn't really do everything, does it? It doesn't really. It finds its place. Okay? Technology problems, reduced instructor assistance, they want access to them, overwhelmed, 
Okay? And the workload. Now, do you remember your Tolstoy? The first line of Anna Karenina? All happy families are alike. Unhappy families are unhappy in their own unique ways. What did Tolstoy mean by that? He meant this. In order for a marriage to be happy, you have to resolve a whole number of issues. Love, sex, money, in-laws, work, intellectual capacity, emotional stability. It goes on and on and on and on. What he meant by that line is, if a marriage is happy, they pretty much resolve most of those. Unhappy in their own unique ways means that if any one of them goes off the track, it'll, dis, you know, it'll dissuade a marriage, right? So you could, you know, you could have great sex and no money. You, you don't have a good future. You know what I'm saying? I mean, any number of these things will derail a marriage. So at the Sloan Foundation, they asked us to look at what are the components of satisfaction for students when they are genuinely satisfied with an online or blended course. These are they. These are the Anna Karenina components. And if you want to see that phenomenon, go back to that book, Germs, Guns, and Steel, by Jared Diamond. It's phenomenal. What they are, if they're satisfied, is they have reduced their ambivalence about the value of this course in some way or other. They see an enriched learning environment. Okay? They know the rules of engagement better in these courses than they did in the other ones. Okay? They feel a sense of commitment. They have less amb ambiguity. They feel more engaged, and they feel more latitude. If these are all in place, the student will be satisfied. But if any one of them goes off the track, like they feel like you're great in all of these, except you didn't tell them what you expected in the course, they will not be satisfied. They will not be satisfied. They're interesting. They're interesting in this way. OK. Where'd it go? Never mind, I found it. Web 2.0. I'm not going to insult you by showing a lot of Web 2.0 things. How many of you remember the little portable blue Smith Corona typewriter? Sure. And that generation is shown again. The only place, it's a great story, which is true. The CEO got together, got Smith Corona people together, and said, Congratulations, you have come close to perfecting the electric typewriter. My congratulations to you. His next word with them is, unfortunately, we have perfected the irrelevant. Smith Corona is no longer in business. The only place you can buy these typewriters is on eBay. And they're expensive. They're expensive. Smith Corona is an example of a company whose value proposition didn't keep up with the changing technology. They were developing typewriters, you know, while word processing was coming on. Now, when my faculty tells me these kids don't get it, and I've done everything I can do to teach them, and they don't learn. I ask, we give them this quiz. Give yourself a point for each one of these. Have you ever created your own web page by yourself? Used a collaborative multiplayer environment like Second Life or World of Warcraft? Downloaded, installed, or used an open source software? Contributed to a public wiki? Kept a blog, a public blog? Contributed to the development of any open source project. Use any internet-based communication tool like Skype, WebEx, WebEx, Dim Dim, Uvu, Yada, Dada, blah, blah. <laughs> use the shopping bot to buy something. Okay? Can use advanced search techniques, say, to find 500 credit card numbers. Okay? <laughs> Participate in any interest-based game or special interest group. Participated in a social network of any kind. Tweeted. Have you ever tweeted? Most of my faculty say no. Most of my faculty say no. And basically the kids, many of them have done all of this stuff. That's their environment. Okay, we're almost done. Student ratings. We have a very, very high stakes end of course evaluation form on our campus. It's terribly high stakes. It's used for promotion. It's used for tenure. It's used for all kinds of things. It's very contentious. Very contentious. Uh, 16 items. Last one being overall rating of the instructor. Okay? 
It is now online. It is now online. Uh, allegedly, it has two purposes. To help you improve your instruction. But my faculty tell me I get the results so late in this, you know, or after the semester, the train has left the station for this course. And to give some summary overall assessment of your teaching prowess. Now, I don't know if they work for either one of those. But we do them. Students have a voice. It's not an issue of do you want them to rate. You, do you want students to have a voice in this? If so, what kind of a voice should they have? And we've investigated these. I love this literature. I love the literature of student evaluation of instruction. First of all, I have, I have a blog that I'm keeping on my campus where I'm asking my faculty to share the one comment that a student wrote about them in the open space that has stayed with them their entire career. You all have one. There's one lurking around in your subconscious or your conscious. One, one way, yeah, sure. A woman in business shared with me, one of my good friends, that a student wrote to her, if only she taught as well as she dressed. <laughs> in the third person. Not even in the first person, in the third person. A man in uh, um, uh, engineering got a comment from a student that said simply, stay away from earth tones. You know, I mean, he stayed with him his whole teaching career. Had nothing to do with anything. Stay away from dirt, you know. I have two, my own personal. Uh, a student wrote to me, Chuck, you teach applied multivariate statistics. It was a long one. He said, when you're absolutely comfortable in what you're teaching, he used metaphorically, he said, you're able to drift down the river, drift off into the eddies and get back on topic when you, whenever you please. When you're less sure of the material, you begin covering material and your body language extinguishes questions in the class. Now, I know that's simply not true. <laughs> but that's what he wrote. Very, very insightful. Very ins the other one to me was, Chuck Jubin is a very smart man. He may be even as smart as he thinks he is. Isn't that interesting? Don't project arrogance. Don't project arrogance. Everyone has one. And we're building a blog, and it is fascinating reading. You can start with Portland State. It's amazing. It's amazing what, what kids have said. There's a, there's a phenomenon in this rating called Dr. Fox. Dr. Fox is a professor who seduces good readings from his students by feigning caring for them. It's a phenomenon in this literature. Terrible teacher, but I care about you. you know, you know, I care about you. Okay? We, I'm going to show you. We, I wrote a paper about this called Dr. Fox Rocks because if the students like you on their blogs, you rock. Okay? You rock. Um, and I presented it to the faculty senate, and there was a faculty member named Fox. <laughs> she will not speak to me to this day. She will not speak. Really believe that I was talking about her. I could not explain to her this was a Jane Doe. I could not explain to her. She complained to me, to the provost, to the president, to the board of trustees. And all she had to do was come to me and say, Chuck, this the title makes me uncomfortable. And I, will I would have changed it in a heartbeat. She didn't, so I published it as Dr. Fox. You know? So, I mean, it, it's interesting. You can find a subset of this literature to support any position you want to take. Valid, invalid. Useful, not useful. You can, anyone you want. Pick one, and you can argue on any side of it. You can do just wonders with this. Now, we did a study. We did a data mining study to see what it is students would consider about you that would lead to an excellent rating, to an overall rating of excellent. And we found the answer. We did a data mining study. Now, here's what I did. The outcome measure was your overall rating, because what faculty members said to me is, what I do is I look at my overall rating and I read the comments. And then I'm crushed by the bad comments. Remember Leo Glascalia? A thousand people tell you you're great, and one person tells you you stink. What do you believe? Absolutely. Okay. And we use that as the outcome measure. The other 15 items on the questionnaire, you know, use class, blah, 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 blah. The college they were in and the level of course they taught. You know, lower undergraduate, upper undergraduate. To see what would predict an overall rating of excellent. And he, I see the answer? Mm -hmm. I, hope the, I hope the technology works. There's the answer. We did it with 1,200,000 student responses. The only thing that predicts are other items on the questionnaire, three in, predict, in per particular. 
if they give you an overall rating on the question that asks about your willingness to facilitate their learning, whatever that means, your ability to communicate ideas and information, and your respect and concern for students, the probability of your getting an overall rating, or our faculty getting an overall rating, is virtually 100%. 100%. Isn't that interesting? Here's what leads to a poor rating. Those three, you get poor. Lead pipe cinch, you're going to get hammered. You're going to hammer it. So if you don't care about what they learn, you can't speak, you can't communicate, and you don't give a damn, you're going to get a poor. You're going to get a poor. Now let me show you how. Are you with me on that? All right. Now, here's what we do. Now, got the rule in your head. Facilitate, communicate. Them. So I take all my faculty over, you know, my, my whole 2,000 faculty student responses, and I just harvest those that all got excellent. Okay? You with me? Don't, don't put them in the colleges. Just get them all into a pile. Then I put them back into their individual colleges, into engineering, into, into, you know, into optics, into whatever you do. Okay? So on the left-hand side of this is the proportion of excellent ratings in, in our colleges, some of our colleges, with the high in education, okay, and the low, in this case, in engineering. Okay, here's, the, here's, the, here's what goes on. Here's the narrative that goes on. The engineers say to the educators, you get good ratings because you give all A's. And the educators say to the engineers, well, if you tried teaching once in a while, maybe your ratings would get better. <laughs> I mean, that's what goes on. You know the politics of higher education. It goes on. But when I just take those who, those who conform to rule number one and put them back into their colleges, they're all getting excellent ratings. It doesn't matter what college you come from. If you conform to that rule, you get an excellent rating. Here's the way it looks with the modalities. Look on the left-hand side. Proportional excellent ratings at our university by modality. The highest rated courses are the blended courses, followed by the online courses, followed by the enhanced courses, followed by face-to-face -face courses, followed by interactive TV. Those poor old people who teach interactive TV get hammered. We no longer use interactive TV. Oh, same thing happens. Same thing happens. Now, you'll be happy to know this is the end. This is the end. Um, what could that be? What in the world? Do we have any statisticians in the group? That's a black swan. Damn you, good. <laughs> Damn you, good. That's the probability of a 10 standard deviation event. That is the pro exact probability of something happening out at 10 standard deviations. Any algorithm we know will set this equal to what? Yeah. Zero. It cannot happen. Any predictive model we'll have, unless you're working in optics or nuclear physics, this cannot happen. It will predict there is no chance that this will happen. But you know what? They do. They do. Here's the, here's the, here's the conversation I have with my wife about the Florida lottery. Jude, your chances of winning a lottery are only trivial greater than if you'd never been born. Her response, somebody wins. That's her response. That's her response. Nicholas Nassim Taleb wrote a book called The Black Swan, which for me was an epiphany. Changed my life, blew my hair back. It's one of those. If you haven't read it, read it. Okay. What he's talking about is our total inability to deal with uncertainty. And to deal with black swans are totally unpredicted events that have monumental impact on history and society. And there are a few that were unpredictable. And they're characterized by this, this sort of backfilled narrative. Oh, we could have predicted them if, but the point is we didn't. 9-11 was a black swan. Nobody predicted it. 
But as soon as it happened, we had this huge narrative about, we could have predicted it if only we did. The point is, you didn't. <laughs> the history didn't predict it for you. The first thousand days of a turkey's life are wonderful. <laughs> it doesn't do anything to predict what's going to happen to the turkey the day before Thanksgiving. That's a black swan. It doesn't help you. Not Google has changed all of our lives forever. Did anybody ever predict Google? No way. Harry Potter. Don't you find it just in life wonderful that J.K. Rowling could sit and write a damn book on a napkin in Scotland and be a billionaire? Who would ever predict that in the publishing industry? It doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't happen. But it did. There, there are negative black swans. Y2, Y2K, remember that? People made millions of dollars predicting something that never happened. <laughs> never happened. Okay? And they're undetectable. I mean, the backfield narrative. And there are negative black swans. Imagine this. This is interesting. Imagine this. There is a legislator who argued vehemently for putting steel doors in air, airliners. And he lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and he fought the airline lobby and Congress passed it and it became a law and his constituency unelected him. Right? The lobbies would have done him in. But he would have prevented 9-11. 9-11 would have prevented and nobody would have ever known, right? Nobody would have ever known. Can you think of a recent black swan, a very recent black swan? Don't think too hard, it's the end of the day. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now, look at the backfield narratives. There's Congress, blah, 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 same crap. Just like these, just like these fools who talk about what happened in the stock market. They don't have a clue what happened in this. They've got narrative one, narrative two, narrative three. Now, what I'm saying at the end of this, what I think another black swan is, is this. I really believe that that's it. Now, I know there are issues here at Portland State University, but it, it is happening. I'm just going to read, I'm going to read two things to you that I will, I will, let me read this to you. Oh, just, just a, uh, uh, Another wonderful book is called The Ghost Map. Have you ever heard of The Ghost Map? Yeah. Stephen Johnson. Portland Johnson. Reads. I'm sorry? There's a program where everybody reads the same book from the library, and it's this year's book. That oh, reading God, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Stephen Johnson writes some wonderful books. What, what, basically, what The Ghost Map is, is built around the cholera epidemic of 1853 in London and how it was solved. And it's just a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous book. And I won't, I won't spoil it. I mean, you're going to read it. It's just, it's just terrific. It's just terrific. But he's got this at the end of The Black Swan. History has its epic thresholds where the world is transformed in a matter of minutes. A, le a leader is assassinated. A volcano erupts. A constitution is ratified. But there are other, smaller turning points that are no less important. A hundred disparate hysterical trends converge on one single modest act. Some unknown person unscrews the handle of a pump on the side street of a bustling city, and years and decades that follow, a thousand changes ripple out from that simple act. It's not that the whole world has changed instantly. The change itself takes many years to become visible, but the change is no less momentous in its quiet evolution. I honestly believe this is it. I do. One more, and then we're done. Then we're done. From Taleb, this is for you. We are quick to forget that just being alive is an extraordinary event, of, an event of extraordinary good luck, a remote event, a chance occurrence of monstrous proportions. Imagine a speck of dust next to a planet a billion times the size of the Earth. The speck of dust represents the odds in favor of your being born. That's true. The huge planet rep represents the odds against it. Stop sweating the small stuff. Hey, God bless everybody. Thanks a million. Go for it. The booze is here. But we also have just a few minutes. If anybody wants well, yeah, to ask sorry. a question. Of course. of course. We'd be happy to take some. If I extinguish you completely, I'm sorry. <laughs> now look, let me tell you, I've got measurement protocols, I've got student satisfaction questionnaires, I've got all the stuff on the lawn. I mean, you don't have to go through all that. 
You can have my student satisfaction questionnaire and cherry pick any items you want. On. We just have to Google these, right? Yeah, just Google them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just we don't need your URL. Let's no, just Google them. No, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's there. You got the first. There it is. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. With all the statistics behind you, do you have, do you understand this? Do I understand it? Because statistics is one thing, but do you understand what you're seeing in those numbers? This really had a great quote. He said, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Do I really understand it? I don't know how to answer that question except saying that this for me is a totally existential experience. It is happening, it is evolving, it is changing. Um, I think if I ever said that I understood it, I would have to quit. That would be my answer to that. No, I don't completely understand it. I am learning something about it every day. And what I can say to this is I have taught online many courses. I have taught many, many hybrid courses. I've taught with Web 2.0, and what it has done, it has made me a better teacher. Mm -hmm. It has made me reflect on my own. I have taught what's happening on our campus. Oh, this is good, happening on our campus. We're now into video capture, you know, broadcasting our lectures. It's, it's incurring in this. And I've, and, I, and, it, and I've done this, and I've watched myself teach. Don't ever do that. <laughs> Don't ever do that. But what it has is something that I haven't done for years as a micro-teach. I haven't sat down and watched myself do this in terms of my idiosyncrasies, and it's helped me. What this does is, if you get a group of faculty arguing about this, sooner or later they'll start talking about pedagogy, and they'll find that this focuses on the teaching act. This has actually revitalized some of our worst burnout cases. Mm -hmm. They're working harder than they ever did, and I can you are you still taping? <laughs> Have you cut it? <laughs> the damn thing will be on YouTube tomorrow. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, have you kind of measured any other types of data rather than say the anonymous student reviews? Because while I think those are, are important for some things, are you're just waiting a hundred percent of the of your cases based upon anonymous student reviews and so no. Well, that's, that, that's a continual thing is, do students know anything about this? Can students recognize good teaching? And does the student, does the student response on a questionnaire reflect effective learning? Right? That's the question. How do we solve that? By that other side of that gizmo that I showed you. Okay, you want to deal with it in, I'll give you an example. Uh, ours is based on an instructional design model, as is yours here. I had a faculty member in English who was a postmodernist come in and say, what is this instructional design? And threw Derrida on my desk. And I had, I had to learn about deconstructionism, whatever the hell it is, all right? And deal with it. The way we get at that is trying to make it authentic within those small pockets within the discipline. That's where we get at student learning. That's where we get at it. To answer your question, no, we don't put in. But the question is, in a culture like yours or ours, is how are we going to value that student voice? And are we going to value it? Are you going to discount it? Are you going to respond to it? Are you going to involve them in the conversation? I have a lot of students doing research in this. And it's interesting. We immediately talk about blended learning. And we then segue immediately to talk about blended teaching. Isn't that right? Uh, yeah, you yes. know, I agree with you that it's essential to involve the student voice. I'm just saying that in other circumstances where you see people having the opportunity to get anonymous reviews on, on a wide range of things, you notice that people tend to be extremely critical when it is absolutely anonymous, they can say whatever they want, and it's possible that people can base their judgments upon other things. So I'm not saying don't consider it, I'm just saying, you know, have you considered including other predictions? Oh, absolutely. Than, um, the you know, response is, what, what is the answer to that question? You need to triangulate it in every question. You get you know, from many, multiple, multiple perspectives. What is effective teaching? We have our faculty peer review. They, they, deal with, they, they deal with each other that way in terms of, and let me say this about that. You know Immanuel Kant, categorical imperatives? Okay. We talk about what items should be on the form, and we'll fight, I've been on 25 blue ribbon committees about which items, and all they turn out to be is this tedious wordsmithing 
that doesn't get you anywhere. Then we go to lunch and everybody knows who the best teachers are. Everybody knows it. And everybody knows that everybody knows it. I mean, it's some categorical imperative, whatever it is, that, it's that, that, that quality issue. But we try to get at that in a more authentic way within the discipline. It's an excellent point. It's an excellent point. Another question about getting from effectiveness to excellence. How do you, how do you get that from this? <laughs> excellence. Remember the book, in the good, is, good is the Enemy of Excellence, uh, in terms of do this excellence. Um, how do we get there? Uh, I, I guess what I'd say when we try to build in our culture to get there is to celebrate excellence. To look for it in its natural organic state and then to celebrate it and then try to model it for other people. That, that's as best I can do in terms of what I can do in terms of excellence. You know how it is. Come on, we're all teachers. You know how good it feels when you nailed it. You know what I'm saying? There is nothing better. There's another thing. It's like academic afterglow. Man, I got it, I nailed it, and I got it. And nobody has to know. You know. Nothing feels worse than when you didn't. And you know it. And there's no one in this room, but I must confess there are days I put it on cruise control. You know, I just didn't feel like it. And I know I've done it, and I feel terrible about it. But I do it. It's part of the teaching, teaching enterprise. But I guess that that's, again, existential. We're always striving for excellence. We're always striving for excellence. There's a guy in Australia that... His name is John Biggs. If you just go to YouTube, he's talking about that, and, he, and he's talking about, I don't know if I buy this or not, but he's got, he's got level teachers. He's got three levels of teachers. Um, level one teacher has said, I've done everything I can, so it's their fault. Okay? I've done everything I can. It's them. Okay? That's what he calls level one. Level two, he says, then you concentrate on the teaching act. There are good teachers and there are bad teachers. That's level, you know, that's, and his third level is that more where you're in the facilitative kind of thing. But I know some of my departments I work with, I've done everything I can, and still they can't. I won't, I'll leave it, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, right, they can. They can. Let's not talk anymore, I'm tired. <laughs>